Golly, how did he die? Oh, Mortimer, don't be so inquisitive. The gentleman died because he drank some wine with poison in it. <laughs> Well, how did the poison get in the wine? Well, we put it in wine because it's less noticeable. When it's in tea, it has a distinct odor. <laughs> now, a warm, warm welcome for Deborah Bloom. I'm so honored to be here at, and give this talk in this beautiful theater that helped launch this amazing Science on Screen program. And it's wonderful for me to be here in Boston, snow or no. I live in Wisconsin, so we're used to it anyway. But I'm, I'm glad to be here, to be moving toward my appointment at MIT. And also I want to mention the fact that one of the things that is especially exciting to me as someone who loves poisons, I know that makes me sound twisted, but they are so cool, is that, uh, one of the world's best toxicology programs is here uh, at UMass. They do incredible work. They actually are one of the few places that has handled a fairly recent arsenic poisoning, fatal arsenic poisoning case here in the Boston area. They're, they're fantastic, and so it's so fun for me to come here <laughs> and hang out with people who know and love arsenic the way I do. Um, I love poisons. I think they're fascinating as a way to explore the world around us. And, and arsenic is really, to me, the best poison for doing that. It tells us so much, not only about our planet, but about ourselves. And so I hope to take a little time here to just explore with you some of the things that make it such a fascinating poison. So this slide I have here is actually a screen grab from The Elements by Theo Gray, which is a kind of an e-book that tries to show you how beautiful all the elements are. Arsenic's naturally occurring. It's the 20th most common element in the Earth's crust, so we find it all over the place, and I'm going to come back to that. It's actually in this kind of beautiful looking, right? And we've been messing around with arsenic for a long time. Uh, I want to mention it here in Dematuria Medica. Uh, De Materia Medica is one of the oldest medical textbooks we know. It was first written and published uh, in the first century AD, and it's a testament uh, to how much knowledge people were experimenting with at that time. There are actually, if you go back to the uh, first century edition, the image I'm showing you here is from the 15th century, but if you go back to the first century, you will find almost 5,000 elements and plants and poisons and herbs that they're discussing, including the clinical trials that some people had done at that time. So it's just a reminder of how we were moving forward in our understanding. Also in the first century, you will find arsenic in another sense. Arsenic is here, but it's also in the first a law ever passed regulating poisons in 82, ID, 82 AD. The Romans, pa Romans passed a law called the Law Against Assassins and Poisons, uh, which tells you that assassins loved poisons. And they specifically mentioned arsenic in that law. It was illegal in 82 AD to own or sell or use arsenic uh, to kill other people. So, and that, <laughs> I mean, they hoped. But that tells us something about where we were with arsenic that early. So, Arsenic is a naturally occurring element. In the first century AD, we know that we can kill other people with it. Do we step back? Do we say, oh, no, 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 no. No, we make it more poisonous. And <laughs> so this uh, alchemist from Persia, Jabir bin Hayyan, uh, was the first chemist to actually make a compound called arsenic trioxide. And it's arsenic trioxide that we're going to find weaving its way through chemistry. And if you could imagine it when you watch Arsenic and Old Lace, these nice little old ladies who you see in the film poisoning elderberry wine, uh, that's what they're using. They're using arsenic trioxide. And they actually, uh, not to give the whole film away, have a wonderful recipe in which they also add in a little bit of cyanide and a little bit of strychnine just to make sure it absolutely works. <laughs> 
But this particular alchemist back in the 17th century, 7th century, sorry, comes up with a way to create the most poisonous form of arsenic that we know, which is arsenic and oxygen, right? It's uh, basically, if you were looking at the chemical formula, you'd see an atom of arsenic, three of oxygen, and that becomes beloved of all poisoners. And this particular woman uh, in Rome, Giulia Tofana, is famous because by the time she was caught and executed, she would mix this up in cosmetics for women who were unhappy with their husbands. Um, and by the time they finally figured out that she was running this business, this would be in the 17th century, she had uh, killed almost a thousand people, or she was linked to almost a thousand deaths. She looks pretty innocent, which I kind of like about her. Um, this is uh, just a bottle of arsenic trioxide, and this comes in about the beginning of the 19th century. If you know anything about the history of poisoning, the 19th century is considered the golden age of poisoners. <laughs> and arsenic's nickname in Europe at that time was the inheritance powder because so many people used it as a shortcut to getting what they wanted in a big fat hurry. What makes arsenic trioxide a great homicidal poison? It's tasteless. Right? Everyone, want, you want a good homicidal poison to be tasteless, right? And in fact, when you first see scientists looking at arsenic in the 19th century, you can find them mixing it into vanilla pudding, right? I'm going to, can I taste it in the vanilla pudding? Why no? How about in, and so you see them going through a whole lot of food things until some of them end up in the hospital. Um, but we know that arsenic is tasteless, it's odorless in, in a solution, it is textureless, so it was a fabulous poison. You just would go out, you'd mix it in, it would mimic a natural illness, and it was really easy to get because we used it cosmetically. So this is, in fact, if you go back to the toward the bottom of this slide, you will see that this is perfectly harmless and the only safe French preparation of arsenic. So it's harmless, it's French, it makes you beautiful, right? Let me show you another one of these. The arsenic will make you charming, right? Dr. Campbell's, and I especially love these advertisements, safe arsenic complexion wafers. And here's Dr. McKenzie's improved harmless arsenic wafers. So in the 19th century, and this is one of the things that makes arsenic so interesting when we look at it culturally, we have this sort of dualistic uh, attitude toward poisons that we see today, right? First, we know this is really dangerous and it will kill you. We know that because we have a whole history of not only Giulia Tofana, but the Borgias loved arsenic. We know it kills you, and yet... Here it is, it's super handy. We can make it industrially because of the work of alchemists like Albert Hayam. And we're gonna now use it in everything because, hey, it's harmless. So you start seeing, especially in the 19th century, women would have this in their cosmetic. You know, it'll make that beautiful, pale, clear Victorian complexion. Uh, it was in fact chronic low-level arsenic poisoning, right? It may <laughs> And women use this all the time to make their skin, look at this, free of blotches and blemishes and coarseness and redness and freckles and pimples. Arsenic cured everything. So you just went down and got it in a cosmetic solution, right? And they use, the other thing that's interesting about arsenic is that in the laboratory, you can use it to make a really beautiful green dye. So women's clothes were dyed with it. Um, wallpaper. This is William Morris. If you know the uh, designer William Morris, he loved the greens of arsenic. So this is a very poisonous sample of William Morris arsenic wallpaper. And there are actually books of William Morris wallpaper that have to be locked up now in special containers because they are so toxic, right? Um, so you had wallpaper. I wanted to show you a picture of a couple. Oops, did I go past that? Yeah, let me go back and then I'll go back to that. These are two people who were poisoned by wallpaper uh, from the 19th century. Um, well, obviously, the one on the left is Napoleon. Napoleon, we know, 
uh, was poisoned by arsenic because one of the things we've learned retrospectively about arsenic is that it deposits in your hair and your fingernails. So they exhumed Napoleon's body. His hair was full of arsenic. There used to be a lot of theories that the British had secretly poisoned him while he was in prison. But as it turns out, in the uh, rooms in which he was imprisoned, the wallpaper was arsenic green wallpaper, probably evil William Morris wallpaper. And <laughs> there was a lot of damp sea air and mold grew in the wallpaper, and the wallpaper is still off-gassing arsene gas, right? Arsenic lasts a long time. And so we know that Napoleon was actually poisoned by his wallpaper. Over here on the right, we have, as this is my hyperspeed uh, through the history of arsenic, is Claire Luth Booth, Booth, I can't say that, who when she was the American ambassador to Italy was poisoned, well, was poisoned by her wallpaper and had to be recalled. Um, and arsenic was used in other really fascinating ways in this time period. It was used to color candy. Um, it's hard to believe, but green candies in the middle of the 19th century were arsenic green and red candies were uh, colored red by red lead. So you had a lot of childhood poisonings. They had one case in uh, a little north of London where they had 42 children. Uh, about a third of those died in an arsenic poisoning case. Eventually, Britain came in and said, no, nah, you know, we're going to use a different dye. But uh, when you go back and you look at arsenic dye during this time period, uh, they used it for cake decorations, pre-made cake, you know, like little green leaves that you put on cupcakes. Um, they used it to color flowers. They used it to color wallpaper. They used it to color clothes. They used it so much that anyone could get it without a trail, which is the other thing you really want with a good homicidal poison, right? <laughs> so I was just down buying a little uh, cosmetic solution or some wallpaper or some fly paper. Um, this is uh, one of the things that resulted in the 19th century, is it's a century in which we see arsenic serial killings. And this is Marianne Cotton. She was British. She's an infamous arsenic serial killer. Um, <laughs> from Britain, she killed 21 people before they finally figured it out. Uh, she went through a series of husbands. She went through a series of children who were inconvenient, right? <laughs> Um, and her favorite delivery method for arsenic was porridge in the morning, which ag again will tell you something about how tasteless it is, because you know that's not a material that masks a strong taste. <laughs> the interesting thing about arsenic is this. So my poison ring is, that I'm wearing here uh, would hold about half a lethal dose of arsenic. Arsenic in a uh, uh, super toxic form is not going to be like a cyanide or a strychnine where you can take a tiny amount and really kill someone if you want to. You know, you're looking at maybe a quarter to a half a teaspoon of arsenic. I think I've got that about right. But the thing that people used to do with arsenic that was so clever, and she did this, is they wouldn't give you a toxic dose that day. They'd just give you a little, and you'd start getting sick and then you get a little sicker. And pretty soon, darn it, you know, so-and-so, he has a sore throat, he has a stomach ache, he has all the things that happen with a broad spectrum poison like arsenic. And so it was really easy to get away with this until scientists completely ruined that, right? <laughs> so as always, so what happens in the 19th century is that scientists completely screw up the golden age of poisoners, right? Uh, you know, just ruining another good thing. And so what happened was that as the uh, science of toxicology started to emerge in about 1920 or 1820 or so, people started saying, well, what are we going to do first? We'll do arsenic because arsenic is the thing that everyone's using. And so about 1840, a British chemist who had been incredibly frustrated, he uh, testified at a trial in which um, the poisoner had walked away, uh, developed a very primitive test to find arsenic in a corpse. And this is the test, actually, that you were looking at. Uh, and I love this because it just shows you how difficult this was, but you take a suspect body, instead of just feeding the last meal to the dog, which was what they were doing, you'd take a suspect's body, you'd mince up some of it, you'd distill it up, 
and you'd heat it up and you'd add in some acid and as it came out the end of that tube where you see the guy holding the upside down test tube, as it cooled on the glass, if there was arsenic, it would make what they call an arsenic mirror, a black mirror. And so if that black mirror formed, that said to you there was arsenic in those tissues. And it was just as simple as that. Later, it got better, right, and more sophisticated. And still, we start doing something where we say, well, you know what, okay, okay, we're going to watch the way we use arsenic, but now that we know just how poisonous it is, why don't we use it as a pesticide? And so lead arsenate pesticides were, until we came up with organophosphates around the time of World War II, the most popular pesticides in the United States, and we routinely applied about 20 to 30 million pounds of them across the country. The number one crop we used these, sprayed these on was apples. Um, and in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, because this is a mix of lead and arsenic, uh, there are still places where you can't plant, right? Because the ground is still so poisonous. And the interesting thing about this is that it was hugely promoted by the US government, right? Super cheap, broad spectrum poison, kills everything. I mean, the US had gotten in some trouble because American apples had poisoned people in England, and England had boycotted in the 1920s American apples because they were so loaded with arsenic. But we still start uh, keeping this on, and in the 1930s, the FDA, which was at that point overseeing insecticides, um, uh, this was before, this was in the mid-30s, uh, actually came up with a jingle. Instead of A is for apple, they had an uh, idea that they would do for, <laughs> school children would learn, A is for arsenic. Um, lead, if you please, protector of apples against arch enemies. And they played this jingle on FDA radio shows to try to promote <laughs> these pesticides now I want to talk about some of the consequences of arsenic in the environment, and I'm going to come back to that. This is a less than wonderful map, I've realized, by the US Geological Survey, but it's an arsenic map of the United States. And this is naturally occurring arsenic. As I said, arsenic is uh, the 20th most common element uh, in the soil. And if you look across this map, if it's red, you have arsenic naturally occurring in groundwater above the EPA's safe drinking water standard for arsenic in drinking water. And that's 10 parts per billion. And, and I want to move us away from homicidal into environmental. So if you look up in New England, you'll see a lot of yellow. Yellow is also above the drinking water standard. Uh, red is so much above the drinking water standard that the water should be considered unsafe. Uh, what we're learning about arsenic as an environmental contaminant is that at these parts per billion level, uh, it plays a, a very high role in chronic diseases. We're still figuring all of those out. Uh, we, this was really discovered in Bangladesh uh, during the 1960s and 70s when they were having a lot of problems with uh, infectious organisms in surface water. WHO went in and spearheaded a program to put in tube wells so people could get ni nice clear groundwater without doing the geological testing. And it turns out that the aquifer in Bangladesh uh, rests upon one of the most arsenic rich bedrocks in the world. And they started getting these weird, inexplicable diseases related to arsenic exposure. This was at the part per billion level. Um, but they got uh, in a population where people eat fish, vegetables, and rice, they got uh, both heart disease and diabetes. And they were able to actually do the retrospective work to show that that was related to arsenic, right? Arsenic damages the circulatory system. Arsenic damages the pancreas. It's a multi-spectrum, amazingly interesting poison at the part per billion level. So in these areas of the United States, you see it over in the Central Valley of California, there's a, a kind of arsenic belt in Wisconsin that you can see right in that red in the middle of the country. And if I, and this map had worked properly and I went up into New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine and up that way, you can get arsenic. The EPA level is 10 parts per billion. You can get it at 3,000 parts per billion. 
in some well. So a lot of these states are trying to work to get these arsenic levels down to something reasonable with wells and testing programs. Um, this leads me to arsenic in rice, which the FDA is investigating at this moment. Um, and there's a, both, two of the factors I just discussed play into the arsenic and rice issue, and then one more. One is that a lot of arsenic contaminated water is, uh, a lot of rice is grown in areas where there's arsenic contamination of soil. You see it in parts of India, you see it in Bangladesh, you see it in, uh, uh, in China. China was the first country in the world to set an arsenic limit on rice. And you see it in the United States for two reasons. One is that we grow rice in areas where there's a lot of natural contamination. And the other is, especially in the American South, they grow rice where they used to grow cotton and the pesticide they used on cotton was lead arsenate. So, and the third part of that is that the rice plant, if you look at its sort of biomechanics, is a unique vacuum for pulling metal metallic elements like arsenic out of the soil. So both arsenic and cadmium uh, cause serious problem for rice eaters, and at this particular moment, it's arsenic and rice that the FDA is looking at. Arsenic stores in the rice plant in the outer husk and bran. So brown rice is much higher in arsenic than white rice. I kind of hate that everyone eats brown rice because of all the, you know, fiber and nutrients. But in fact, in general, brown rice is higher. Uh, Dartmouth did an amazing series of studies looking at uh, rice, uh, arsenic in organic brown rice products, right? And were able to find it because people were using brown rice syrup as a sweetener as opposed to corn syrup, right? Which is kind of frustrating. Um, uh, they found that baby formulas that were sweetened with brown rice syrup were in fact at an unsafe level. So we're all still trying to figure this out. WAL, WHO now calls Bangladesh the uh, greatest human mass poisoning in history. Uh, there's about 35 million people who show signs of arsenic exposure there. Um, and the rice problem is being looked at both by WHO and the FDA. So we're all kind of looking at this issue of arsenic as a naturally occurring environmental problem, as well as my favorite homicidal poison. Um, and I want to close on a homicidal note, right? <laughs> because I love them so much. Uh, this is um, a story actually from The Poisoner's Handbook, which was the book I wrote about uh, a whole collection of poisons and a couple of um, scientists uh, during the Prohibition era who was trying to figure out how to catch killers. And this was an arsenic mass murder. This is a, a picture from an arsenic mass murder case in 1922. Um, there was someone, this person was never caught, he went, he or she uh, went to a restaurant uh, on the lower sort of south end of Broadway and in the middle of the night mixed arsenic into all the dough that was waiting for, it was for the next morning's lunch or the next day's lunch. Um, bread dough, pie pastry dough, the refrigerator was full of it and they mixed arsenic trioxide into all the dough and so the next day which was on a hot day in August, uh, people ate lunch and then, man, probably close to 20 of them died and another 40 to 50 were hospitalized from arsenic poisoning. And I wrote about this in Poisoner's Handbook. I was uh, caught by this story, and, and I, this is the point I want to make, although I can be flippant about homicidal poisonings. There was a young girl who had gone to, she was helping to support her family, she was 16, and her mother had offered to make her a box lunch that day, and she said, no, it was too hot, right? She would just go get something. Uh, like a sandwich or something at the lunch counter and off she went and she ate at this particular restaurant and she died. And when I was looking at the newspapers trying to figure out this story, there was an interview with her mom in which you can see the mom talking to the police and she's right in that moment where she could have saved her daughter's life, right? If I had pushed harder, if I had made her take that box lunch, I was right there, I didn't do it, my daughter died. And because I'm a working mother, 
I, I just could see that, that moment where you just didn't do it, right, and your daughter died. And so in one of the arsenic chapters, I started out telling that story. And after the book came out, uh, uh, about a month or so after the book came out, I heard from a man in Seattle who said, you've solved the mystery of what happened to my aunt. My, I guess it would have been his great aunt, um, because no one ever talks about what happened to her. And all I have is this photograph of her. She's the little girl in the flowered hat uh, with her mother and um, this man's um, grandfather. And he said, and I have a book of poetry. And he said, um, the other thing I want to tell you, these were, um, her name was Lillian Getz, and this was an Eastern European Jewish immigrant family. And he said, they never went to synagogue again, right? They could not worship a God that had let their daughter die this way, and they would not go ever again. And it changed the whole dynamic of the family for years to come. And in fact, the mom would almost never leave the house. She was so traumatized by this. And so later that year, I gave a talk at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, and I told this story. And I said, and I had had uh, a couple other people from murders that had happened in the 1920s contact me. One of them was the grandson of an arsenic murderess in the book uh, who was trying to find her grave. And uh, she was electrocuted, and the family refused to accept her body, so she's buried at Sing Sing Prison. Uh, so I told him that so he could go and, and find her grave. And I said to the medical examiners, this is crazy to me. These are deaths that happened almost 100 years ago, and they are still haunting these families. And they said, absolutely right. Uh, we see that. We have people who come back for decades because the murder, they didn't get the answers to a murder that they wanted or they didn't get see justice, or they need the answers they never got, and they will come every year for decades to the medical examiner's office trying to find a different answer. So that is really the other point I want. It's not a comedy point, right? But it's an important point. I mean, these poisons weave through our lives, environmentally, homicidally, the way we use them and the way we respond to those uses helps, tells us a lot about who we are at any given moment. But poisons are not just stories of elements in the earth or toxic elements, they're stories about who we are. And that makes us uniquely fascinating and occasionally that makes us hilarious which you will see in Arsenic and All Lace, which is one of my favorite monies, movies ever, and which is poison comedy to the max. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the movie.